If you have a Bible, you might turn to 2 Kings, the 22nd and 23rd chapter. And the reading we wanted was chapter 22, verse 8, and then verses 10, 11, and 13. But the whole text, in terms of both chapters, is important. Now, because the schedule changed, my schedule primarily, I haven't been here since the second Sunday, Thanksgiving, in October. And you may not remember everything I said then. Okay, that's a possibility, right? So, interpreting the times was the topic. And the text was Luke chapter 12, verse 54 to chapter 13, verse 5. And Jesus tells three stories in that passage. And Brian mentioned Buffalo, the weather. Well, St. Catharines, we got a lot more. Okay, coming here this morning, in three different areas, the highway is closed down. Uh, twice going toward uh, St. Catharines and one coming toward here. But we got off the highway and uh, found our way back on the highway where there weren't too many cars. So we did get here on time. Thank you. So sometimes we're blessed with snow and maybe sometimes more snow. If you're a football fan, then you really need an orchard park. So Jesus talks about interpreting the times. He says, you know how to forecast the weather. But you can't interpret the present time. And you can't judge, he says, what is morally right. And then the second story, Jesus says, if you're going to court, you have an accuser. And there's a lawsuit. Well, before you get to the judge, make peace. Make peace with your accuser. See, we're all guilty. And Jesus is saying, before God, we all have a bad case. Thereby, there's time right now to make peace with God. And then he tells a third story. The Galileans, Pilate, took their blood as he executed them. And he mixed the blood of the Galileans with the blood of their sacrifices. The same Pilate who tried to wash his hands of the blood of Jesus. And then there's a second story. Jesus says there's 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell upon them. See, in these two cases, was the problem sin? Were they greater sinners than anyone else? He says, no. But you, unless you repent, you too will perish. So somebody has a sign. It's London. And the sign they have on the front and on the back, the end is nigh. And what they're saying is the end of everything is nigh. Well, in Egypt, they might talk about climate. A climate emergency, a climate disaster. Another headline says, doomsday is, in red, not coming. Well, it might be depend on your perspective. Doomsday coming, doomsday not coming. You might know the name. I don't watch the program, Homer Simpson, but he's an inventor. And what he did, he invented an everything okay alarm. See, the alarm. Every three seconds, the alarm goes off. If everything's okay. If it's not okay, I guess it doesn't go off. So the alarm is always, always, always going off. Well, Steven Pinker, a book entitled Enlightenment Now, he says everything is okay. Terrorism, no big deal. Democracy, equality, don't sweat it. No matter what the problem is, well, you know, there's progress. And progress is the chief virtue that you pass on to the next generation. Well, they still have lockups as far as COVID-19 in China. And so there's a new fad. Is it a fad? Or is it a cry for help in China? University students are getting on their hands and knees 
and crawling on the ground in the dark. Well, the authorities are concerned. Why are you doing this? They say to relieve stress. Crawling is a collective ritual. Release feelings of being repressed. Using something that's meaningless to resist meaninglessness in the world. And they say, well, crawling on the ground for us is liberating, is it? A return to a more primal state. So in our world, is everything okay? Well, in our last lesson, as we looked at interpreting the times, the question near the end was, what if the Bible was not available? And we gave examples, the Bible being banned, the Bible placed under state control, the Bible eliminated in our education curriculum, the Bible being ignored by the secular state, the Bible being used as a threat in a court of law, tell the truth or else you'll get it. If the word of God is increasingly out of sight, it becomes out of mind. Perhaps a distant memory or no memory at all. If we do not have the word of God, see, Jesus would say to us, how do you interpret events, the times? How do you make moral decisions? How do you lead society? And so in 2 Kings 22 and 23, the Torah is lost, completely forgotten for generations prior to the reign of Josiah. So notice with Josiah, the topic is a restoration movement, a restoration of the word of God. So I'm going to begin with chapter 22, verse 1, and go into chapter 23, but not quite finish the Josiah story this morning. So Josiah is eight years of age, and he becomes the next king of Israel. Kings before him were evil. Kings before him were assassinated. Josiah reigns in Judah for 31 years. The pronouncement is made in verse 2 of chapter 22 that Josiah did what is right in the eyes of the Lord. In the 18th year of his reign, he's now 26 years of age, he sends his secretary, Shapen, to the temple of the Lord and to Hilkiah, the high priest. See, what they've done, they've collected money, took up a collection for payment of the workers and the materials to repair the temple. But when they repaired the temple in verse 8, during the renovations, Hilkiah, the priest, finds the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. See, the book of the law has been lost for generations, perhaps the 8th century to the 6th century BC. Hilkiah then gives the book of the law to Shapen, the secretary. Shapen reads the book of the law, and then he reads the book of the law aloud in the presence of Josiah the king. So today, other than the church, where do you get a Bible? I would imagine that most homes today do not have a Bible. Well, the Wizard of Id cartoon, the wizard, the king, are in the castle, in a tower, looking out over the square. And in the square, there's a robbery. As they observe the robbery, and they walk away into the castle, the king says, what this kingdom needs is a code of ethics. And the light goes on in the wizard's head. And he says, wait here, sire. And he runs away. And he comes back with a book. He says, here you go, sire, a complete book 
of ethics. And the king says, where did you get this? The wizard says, at the Royal Motel, there's one in every room. Well, that was what it used to be, Carson. See, I was in at least three countries, but three countries in which I spent time in hotels. Four different hotels, three different countries in the last four months. And I checked every hotel I was in, there was no Bible. But I did find a book of Mormon. Now today, what's the source of ethics? For the last 16 months, I've been busily engaged in working for the National Coaching Certification Program. I've helped develop national courses in ethics, and I twice a week make presentations on Zoom to leaders in our society on how to make ethical decisions. See, what was deemed to be common sense at one time is no longer common. Our shared values are no longer shared. We don't have the same ethical principles. You can't take ethics, values, principles that you hold dear for granted. You might be in the minority. Hence, I'm requested to provide mandatory training for community leaders to protect organizations and to protect all participants. So Josiah makes a response. When he hears the words of the book of the law read then by Shaphan, verse 11, he tears his robes. King, right? Royal garments, he tears them. Josiah orders Hilkiah, Shaphan, and others, inquire of the Lord as to the meaning of what is written in the book. See, Josiah is concerned. He is concerned about the greatness of the Lord's anger that burns against Judah because our fathers have not obeyed the words of the book of the law. Well, another comic, Peanuts. So Peanuts is kind of in the desert, it seems. You see cactus, cacti behind him. He's got a pen and a paper. He uses the rock as his table. He wears a fedora and he starts to write. Who he's writing to, I'm not sure. <clears throat> but it says, gentlemen, I have decided career to become a shepherd. Please send me a dozen sheep. See, what kind of a shepherd's going to be? And a dozen sheep and Larry, a book of directions. Ah, what's he said? What's he said? See, in Josiah's time, the fathers did not act on the word of God. Our fathers today, aware of the biblical story. Scripture lacks meaning unless we make a personal application of Scripture. Unless we internalize the words, the images, the stories, the intended message. Well, message. There's a version of the Bible called The Message by Eugene Peterson. The Bible in contemporary language. He tries to present the Bible, the whole Bible, in a style that maybe is readable, understandable, engaging to people today. So, for example, Romans 12, verse 1 reads from the message translation. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work. You're walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. See, people need 
a message. And Peterson tries to provide that in his paraphrased edition. Huldah is the prophetess. See, in verse 16 of chapter 22, she's contacted. And she prophesies because you've lost, you've lost, ignored the book of the law all these generations. Disaster will come upon Judah and Jerusalem. Because you've forsaken God, you've burned incense to other gods, you've provoked the Lord to anger by the idols you have made. Now remember the commandments, Exodus chapter 20, the first six verses. See, we call them the Ten Commandments. But it begins by saying, and God spoke. See, God speaks to his people. I am, that's God's name, as we see in Jesus. I am the Lord. I am the Lord, your God. Well, paganism, you have many gods. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt. I heard Egypt mentioned by Ed and Zabel. Our slavery to sin. Our lack of freedom, Ed. Who brought you out of Egypt. Out of the land of slavery. And the command, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol of any form. I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Think of that word jealous. What it might mean in this context. Punishing the children. Is that fair? For the sins of the fathers. On to the third and fourth generation. But showing love to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. And then it says the second command, you shall not misuse the name, fame, of the Lord your God. So Judah had 430 years of forgetfulness. That's a long time. From when the law was delivered in Sinai to, to Josiah's day. The sins of the fathers are visited upon the children onto the third and fourth generation. That means consequences of sin, right? See, that's a hundred year cycle in today's calendar. See, family dysfunction. Something happens in a family, the dysfunction will last three, four generations a hundred year, years, unless the gospel intervenes and breaks the cycle. And that's what happened in my family. God is a jealous God, the text says. That's not a negative. See, race, that's a positive. God is a jealous God. He's fiercely protective of his relationship, his marriage with his people. See, God does not condone adultery. Don't betray people. Don't break the bond. Don't break the trust. Don't break the covenant. See, God, in that sense, protects us. He's jealous for our good. So Huldah makes a pronouncement. She says, the Lord's anger will not be quenched. Josiah. His reign will be spared because one, his heart is responsive. Two, he humbled himself. Three, he tore his robes and wept. That means he repented before the Lord. God heard his lament. Hence, when he's buried, he's buried in peace. He will not witness the disaster that will accuse and lie waste to Jerusalem and Judea in the coming of Babylon captivity that God will utilize to purify his people. Now remember Jesus, <clears throat> he also laments over the sin and destruction of Jerusalem. We see this in Matthew chapter 23. 
Now, for us, the fact that our physical life is limited might be a blessing. See, I may not live long enough to witness all the impending judgment and disaster that may afflict this world. And Reyes, it's colder these days, and there's lots of snow in St. Catharines. And I think of what's going on in Ukraine as far as the bombing of infrastructure, cutting off water supplies, cutting off energy, cutting off hydro. And you think winter's coming right, it's getting cold. Okay, uh, so already we're tired of winter, but I think let's say what's going to be happening in terms of let's say the suffering of people in Ukraine this winter. And our prayers go out to brothers and sisters in Ukraine. So in chapter 23, just touching upon chapter 23 this morning, in the first two verses, Josiah as the king, go to the temple of the Lord. And notice what he does. He calls together all the elders of Jerusalem and Judah. He calls all the men of Judah, all the people of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, all the people. See, it's all inclusive here. From the least to the greatest, the text says. And the king, Charles, personally reads all the words of the Book of the Covenant. Can you imagine our prime minister doing that? We have forsaken God as a country. So your leader, in this case the King Josiah, personally reads all the words of the book of the covenant, the Torah. They found the Torah after being lost in the temple. See, how long would it take to read the Torah, the first five books? Covenant. How long would it take to read the New Testament? Well, I've never timed myself. You know, we read a little bit here, a little bit there. What if you sat down and read a whole gospel? The gospel of Mark is the shortest. It's active. What if you just read, read Mark's gospel? And then at some other point, Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel and John's gospel. Or maybe it's morning from our class, the book of Acts. I think if you read a book in one sitting, in its entirety, it'll make a lasting impression upon you. See, we just pick and choose a little bit here and there. We nibble at the book. See, to read the New Testament. Well, CBS, a report said, if you read the New Testament 28 minutes a day for 40 days, that's 18 hours to read the New Testament. When I was 11 years of age and baptized in Alabama, I was with somebody in an all-night gas station kind of helping, but sometimes not too many cars. There would be a long interlude before another car would come to get gas. And I read more Bible in that gas station at 11 years of age than I have since. I'd have time, Brian, to read a whole gospel, a whole book, right? I should probably go to a gas station and do that again. Josiah. He personally renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord. To follow the Lord, to keep the Lord's commandments and regulations and decrees with all his heart and all his soul and with all the people of the kingdom. See, I heard you say this morning, Carson, the word commitment. See, he made a commitment. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, you have one of the most important passages, which is repeated three times by Jesus in the Gospels. 
<clears throat> so these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God has directed me to teach you to observe, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live, so that you may enjoy long life, so that it may go well with you, which is repeated in, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 3. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit, when you walk, when you lie down. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. See, this is the great commandment to love God. And we demonstrate love for God by how we love, treat other people. So Jesus repeats the same great commandment of the covenant three times in Matthew 22, Mark 12, Luke 10. And Jesus is saying we must internalize the gospel. Well, I'm going to stop. I haven't finished the Josiah story. See, the rest of the story for Josiah is, and we'll talk about that in two weeks to some extent, he purges Israel, I should say Judah. He purges Judah of paganism. What would that look like today? The Passover has not been celebrated. The Lord's Supper, as we see it, right? Passover, Lord's Supper, not celebrated. Forgotten, forgotten, forgotten for generations. He restores the Passover. They now have a Passover. But there's judgment because of sin. Because of Josiah and his response to God, judgment is delayed. But judgment will come. Well, does God delay judgment of our society? What the biblical text says, a time is coming. That's why Jesus says, interpret the times right. Do right. Make peace with God. Repent. While there's time. So as we make a tentative conclusion of this morning, see what we need is a restoration movement. A back to the Bible movement. Not just back to a book, but honoring the word of God honoring the word who is God. We need that not just in Josiah's day, but in every generation. See, we can't rest upon the 16th century reformation of Luther or Calvin, Zwingli and others, or the 19th century restoration movement of Thomas and Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone and disciples and churches of Christ. See, that was 19th century. What about us in the 21st century? Well, here's an author I know, Michael Korn. I knew Michael Korn and utilized him in the educational workshop when he was a evangelical. He was a writer, but evangelical. Well, he, since that time, has been involved in many things, and uh, he's become an Anglican priest in the meantime. I don't agree with every stance he takes on everything, but publicly, he will preach and teach the person of Jesus Christ and the reality of human sin and our need for redemption. He says a lot of good things. And so in our Bible class next time, we'll give out the article and make it available to other people, an article that he wrote re recently, Give Jesus Another Chance. He says, give Jesus, not churches, another chance. As you might know, every 10 years we have a census. And so in 21, you had to, by law, complete the census of Canada or the penalties, whatever they were. So when they did the census, there's two points. One third 
of Canadians no longer believe. That's doubled, more than doubled, since 2001, in 20 years. More than one third, 34%, claim they no longer believe or have any religion. Christianity, in 2001, those who profess Christianity was 71%. It's now 53%. See, that's what people state in terms of their mindset. So Michael Corn says, people aren't abandoning Christ. That's his perspective. What they are abandoning is organized religion. And I know people in this congregation who have written me emails recently saying, you know what? Institutional religion. See, that's problematic. Go back to Constantine, where it was against the law to be Christian. Constantine legalized Christianity. There were benefits to being a Christian as far as the society. And then paganism was outlawed. And Christianity was made the official religion. See, church and state. In Germany recently, talk to some people who are believers in Jesus but they dropped out of church. Now, one reason they dropped out of church, they'd be kicked out of church, because in Germany, you pay a state tax to the church. You pay 10% to the church. Well, how does the church use that money? 9.5% of that money coming from mandatory taxation goes to upkeep the buildings, which are nice. Old cathedrals. 0.5, half of 1% goes to charity, to the poor. See, some people think, well, I don't want to be taxed. So if I don't pay the tax, I'm excommunicated. I'm kicked out. See, that's what happens. They're not abandoning necessarily Jesus, his true teachings, but institutional, organized Christianity. So Corn says, Many churches promote religion, not Jesus. Would that be a problem today? The message of the Gospels has to be explained anew. People don't know the Gospel message. He says, that's good news. We start again, right? How do we do that? We persuade people by compassion, by example. Corn quotes Gandhi, and this is called the evangelism of the rose, the flower, the evangelism of the rose. So note, Gandhi says, the rose doesn't have to propagate his perfume. It just gives it forth. And people are drawn to it. Live it, and people will come to see the source of your power. See, if we live our faith, people make inquiry as to the source of your faith, of your power, of your hope. So Corn's asking not to give churches, per se, a chance. Remember John Lennon, give peace a chance. Give Jesus a chance. Consider Jesus again, as we find him in scripture, or for a lot of people, consider Jesus for the very first time. See, redemption. Christ can free us and fill us with his goodness his godness. He was crucified. Why? Because he had a different vision of the world and what God wanted than the authorities of his day. So Jesus rejected their world and held out the hope, the promise of another world. I think Reyes, the last hymn, is standing on the promises. Is that right? Standing on the promises of God and not the promises of secular society. That's a good hymn to end on. Thank you this morning, okay? So our challenge, 
See, the invitation is be a follower of Jesus Christ and present with joy Jesus' ultimate message. Peace with God. Peace that overcomes the world. Be like Jesus. And Jesus came to overcome the world and he gives us that same promise and that same hope. So would you stand on the promises of God as our invitation as Ray leads us?